tremendous that he's been able to see you accomplish so much. Well, he did have one other dream, and that was to have a home. Because growing up in social housing, you know, he and my mom wanted a house, a little place. It didn't have to be a big place of their own. Their daughter to get an education, and he would have his tailor shop. And he did get those things in due time. When I was in high school, he had uh, got his tailor shop, and he was very proud and very good uh, tailor, and made a good living eventually with that, and uh, saved up. In those days, people saved to buy a house. And then when I, um, when I won a scholarship, because I did English literature and Spanish literature and French literature and geography and math and some of those things, but I never did any science. I won a scholarship to go to Oxford to do my master's. All expenses paid. so Including it, room and board, everything. 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 It was a, the scholarship. Trinidad and Tobago gave about six scholarships a year. One in science, one in math, one in... Uh, well, one in physics, one in chemistry, one mm. in uh, math, uh, and two in literature. And I got the one in literature. And because all of our exams were Oxford exams, uh, I, we got our exams written and sent to us from Oxford. We wrote them, we, they went back to Oxford, and they were right. corrected. Mm. So you had the O-level, A-level uh, British education. And so I won the scholarship to go into my master's, and it was great because I was going to be a famous international writer. In those days... Is that what you thought? Yes, oh was, yes, oh, okay. I was going yes. to be a famous international writer, and of course Time Magazine was the only international magazine that there was in those days, and I read Time Magazine religiously, and I was going to work for Time Magazine, and I was going to go all over the world and be a foreign correspondent, this was my thing, and I was, eventually I would write fabulous novels, and I would be, be another bestsellers. Jane Austen, I'd be bestsellers. And it's interesting, it's what I really did want to do that. And, uh, but in doing my, my exam for the scholarship, I, we had to do, um, amongst many other books and, and, and prose and poetry, I had to do three Shakespeare's tragedies, three comedies, uh, three historical novels. And of course, I read this Oxford professor who wrote this thesis on or this book on the fact that he thought that Hamlet was manic depressive and Lady Macbeth was uh, obsessive compulsive and Macbeth was passive aggressive and of course Lear had senile dementia, that's what they called it in those days. And I thought, wow, I want to be a psychiatrist. And because I was intrigued by the way he psychoanalyzed their characters, which I'm sure Shakespeare didn't mean to, but he did. And so I, of course, I told my father everything, every little dream, every little hope, uh, every little bad thing that happened. And, and so he said to me, yes, but you can't do medicine because you didn't do science. And I said, I know, I know. And he said, don't you have to do medicine to be a psychiatrist? And we, we had a great family doctor who was another role model for me. He studied at uh, McGill. Isn't and that something? Yes, it's an, an early tie. Isn't right it there. interesting? We yes. talk about connections, how connections mm -hmm. kind of eventually life has a sort of serendipitous way of working itself out. And so he said, well, he didn't think I could either. But then he called my father and said, there's a university in Ireland that's doing a five year uh, um, project. Mm. They believe that medicine is an art informed by science and not a pure science. And so they were bringing in uh, 10 people in every first pre-med class who had reached the top of the bell curve in arts or humanities. So we sent my marks and they said, yep, I could get in and wow. I had the one year in which to do the equivalent of a bachelor in science. So he told that to my father and I hadn't known about it and so we had just gone off and I had signed all the papers to do my master's in Oxford and we were going home and my father said to me, you know, your mom and I have some money that we saved for a house and, but if you could get into this school, uh, we will pay for you. Now, you have to understand that that was really expensive. Uh, five dollars, five Trinidad and Tobago dollars was one pound. And it was about the equivalent in those days of about $60,000 a year. A year? Yes, uh, Canadian dollars. In yes. those days it, was, yeah. it wasn't 60000 no, but, but today it would yes. be about that. And uh, I said, no, you know, there's no way you can afford that. And he said, no, 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 you, you, you must... You must be and do what you want to be, what it is you have a passion for. Despite the fact that you could go to one of the world's best universities yes, on a full scholarship. Absolutely. So uh, I, th I then applied, got in, and was one of those ten people, and 
had the year in which to do my Bachelor of Science and I knew H2O was water so I was I had a good <laughs> head start and eventually I, um, I, I took that year and I, I, I did it because my dad had given me all their money for their house and you had to do what you had to do I couldn't let him down I couldn't is that fail. what you wanted to do oh I wanted to you do medicine you, you knew but that I that wanted was. to do medicine because it was a route to psychiatry because I was going to be a psychiatrist okay. and again we Freud and young and all of those kinds of things and um, of course during the period of medicine as any medical student would tell you you then want to be a neurosurgeon and you then want to be a this and that and I eventually wanted to be an obstetrician and then I wanted to be a pediatrician and I kind of shifted along and came into family medicine, but the point is that, that my parents did that ultimate sacrifice for me. Um, it really meant a lot to me and it also made me believe in, in myself to the extent that I was able to do that Bachelor of Science in a year. Uh, and I love medicine. I, I, it was the right thing for it me was, to do. It was, was it? Yeah. Did and you I, ever have a point where you thought to yourself, no? I should have done, I should have gone to Oxford, I should have continued with literature? No, because I could still enjoy literature and mm -hmm. I thought, I could still write. Mm -hmm. I may not be the Time Magazine correspondent of the you year. You could be the medical affairs correspondent. No, I didn't even <laughs> think about it that way. I yeah. thought I could still write books, novels, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whatever I wanted to do, I could still do that. So I, um, and I was a, a problem for the departments when I became a minister because I used to want to write all my own speeches I mean, Did it was you? kind of interesting but but that's another story but that's how I managed to do medicine and um, and uh, that's how I managed to go to to Ireland and that's how I met my first husband and, and how that's how you, I came to Canada. Okay so how did you come to Canada? You, you met your first husband in, in school? Yes my name was Frank my surname my maiden name and his name was Fry so we kind of he sat immediately behind me we were so we sat alphabetically uh -huh. and uh, I he was so British it was it was it wasn't funny he actually carried a rolled up brolly and and uh, and, and and so as I told you before I had always thought P.G. Woodhouse and Bertie Wooster was very interesting so I kind of found him intriguing and uh, eventually we started to go out and we, we got married um, but he, we didn't want to practice in England at the time because England had just moved to a, an official two-tier system mm. where those who could afford to could buy health care, unions negotiated health care, and those who couldn't, there was a public system where those who were lower income would go. And we began to see the unraveling of health care in England that was terrible. Um, in that the, there was second-rate care for people who couldn't afford it and great hospitals like Barts and London uh, became you know run down and decrepit because the public was going there so it was uh, it was what kind of drove us to we were going to go to the United States I wasn't interested as much but uh, I was reading at the time about this guy named Pierre Elliott Trudeau who was talking about a just society and the role of government in the lives of people, that government was there to give people a sort of a lift up and help them to get the tools they needed to overcome barriers. And I thought, if I had lived in that country, my dad would not have had to, I wasn't mm -hmm. going to have to make them take that sacrifice. I would have been able to get an education through a caring government and my dad could have his home and life would have been different. And, and so I, I was always, I became a liberal um, because of that vision of a just society and I uh, stayed a liberal although I got very involved in medical politics later You on. did and you were known as a fierce negotiator. Uh, well, I, a fair. A fair but fair. Fierce. but fierce negotiator. You were, you came out with some groundbreaking uh, I did, but I, I also, at that time, my children were grown up and I was thinking, now the following year, it was the Canadian Medical Association president was going to have to come from British Columbia, so I thought, okay, I would do that, and then I would go into law. Oh, because, law? Yeah. Why because, not? Well, I was intrigued with <laughs> negotiating, and I kind of was very interested in it at the time, and I, my kids were grown up, they were gone off, and I felt, well, you know, it's time for me to change something. And, I thought I would go and do law because it intrigued me. And then Jean Chrétien came and asked me if I would run and I said no and then the rest is history. Why did you say no? We're jumping ahead a bit and I may move us back soon, but why, why did you say no initially? 